And so, if you would, find your way over to Psalm chapter uh, 63, the 63rd Psalm. We're going we're gonna to read through that, and, uh, and we're going to talk about it for just a moment. Um, but as you're finding your way there, um, I was talking to Elizabeth about um, what this psalm is about. It's about satisfaction, and God being our satisfaction. And so that's just the aim of today. Um, but she was, she was telling me, uh, so about, I guess it was about eight or nine years ago, yeah, probably nine years ago, we discovered that Elizabeth had uh, had a wheat allergy, and so many of you are know this, and we've we've talked at nauseum about wheat and how in our household, like wheat's had to kind of go out the window. We can't eat it. Uh, our kids eat it, and I eat it some, but you know Elizabeth has to go without, and um, and so that started a long search and a long journey uh, seeking after um, good food that doesn't have wheat in it. Seeking after good food that hasn't, doesn't have wheat in it. And that's a lot harder than one would imagine. Uh, they put wheat in everything. They put it in like sauces as thickeners. They put it, it's just in everything. It's, it's tough. It's tough. And so if there's anything, here, here you go. If for whatever reason you want to satisfy my wife in any way, bring her something that is wheat free that's good. And you've immediately satisfied her heart and soul. Uh, you have brought joy. She's been on the search, and we are continue on the search for wheat-free food that will satisfy, that will satisfy the tongue, that will be tasty, that will be good, but also be uh, uh, nutritional and good for us. And so, yeah, 11 years or nine years now, we've been on that journey, and we're going to be on that journey the rest of our lives, continue searching out for the good, the good wheat-free food. And... Listen, we'll go to great lengths to find those things. We'll try. We'll try and fail some things. Uh, but we, we're on a search for that. And continually because, well, we all want good food. We all want good food. And so does my wife. Even if it's wheat free. And so David in this psalm is in a place where he's in the wilderness. And he's searching for satisfaction. He's searching for the satisfaction that his heart and his soul deeply longs for. And he gives us guidance on this personal search that he's on. He gives us guidance for our personal search that every one of us are on. It's not wheat-free food. We are all longing and searching for deep, deep, deep satisfaction. And it's only found in one place, and the psalmist gives us that place and gives us directives in Psalm 63. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, and you're open up to Psalm 63, if you're there, say word. Amen. Let's get into the word so the word can get into us. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. In a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you... As I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I will follow close to you. Your right hand holds me on to me. But those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast for their for the mouths of liars will be shut this is the word of the lord let's pray together lord we love you we thank you speak to us through psalm 23 and david's experience in the wilderness and this poem and song that he wrote of searching and seeking after that satisfaction that he longs for and in jesus name we pray amen in verse 1 and 2 we see that David says, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a dry land, a dry, desolate that's without water. 
So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. For David, when he is experiencing this longing for satisfaction, he shows us that Jesus is our chief desire. Now, I understand that for David, he didn't know the name of Jesus, but we've, dis we've discussed this before. Um, Yahweh was, was David's chief desire, and when we see Jesus come on the scene, uh, most, most clearly, when Jesus is baptized, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit arrive at the, at the, um, um, after John the Baptist. And the prophecy tells us that Yahweh would come after the, one, the voice calling out in the wilderness. Yahweh would show himself at that point. And there we see Yahweh show up in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So Jesus, Jesus is Yahweh. Um, and so we're just going to take that and the rest of this message. I know in the psalmist when David's writing this, he is looking forward, however, to a Messiah. And we know his name is Jesus. So Jesus is for us. Jesus, as we look back, as David looked forward, we look back. Jesus is our chief desire. We're all on this search. We're longing for deep relationship. And, and this is revealed to us by God. God tells us that this is our chief desire. Genesis chapter 17 gives the, co gives the covenant, um, the first covenant that God cuts with, with his people. And, and he says that I will be their God. It's relationship. It's a deep, we have this deep search, desire driving us towards relationship. And God says he is the only thing that can fulfill that. I will be their God, Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. And it's the whole narrative of Scripture. You go all the way to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. It says again, it's repeated in Hebrews, I will be their God and they will be my people. We're all on this search. And what we're actually searching for is we're searching for deep relationship with the Lord. He is the desire. We are eagerly, eagerly seeking after him. We're not just seeking after some idea or some way of living. Although once we seek the person of Jesus and we experience him, it does drive us to a way of living. What we're all truly seeking when we talk about satisfaction is we're seeking a person. And his name is Jesus. It's revealed to us from God. But it's also revealed to us through the hard hits of life. The wilderness. David is in the wilderness. And we too find ourselves in the wilderness at many times in life. And it can be because of, of a plethora of reasons. It can be because of sin. It can be just because of collateral damage. If we get caught up in the brokenness of the world. Sometimes God, by His Spirit, leads us into these wilderness times. Authors in the past and historically have called this the dark night of the soul. These times when it feels like God is distant from us. When, when you're experiencing relational satisfaction with the Lord, you are seeking more of that. But it's most often when we're, when we're in the moment where we don't feel satisfied and we're like, we're asking the question, God, where are you? That's, that's the wilderness. That's the dark night of the soul. And it's tough. Those really tough, hard times in life. Sometimes when we lose something or someone we really desire. This is where David is at. And it brings to light, it reveals this desire and this search that we have in our hearts towards Jesus. Towards deep satisfaction. And here's the deal. We have this desire and this pull. But there's a danger and that's the reason David is speaking in Psalm 63 about guiding us and pointing us and pointing his own self in this desire towards satisfaction. Because desire gone wrong has been humanity's longest problem. Think about it. You go back to the garden. Adam and Eve, they desire to be like God. This is not a bad desire. In fact, they were created like God. Not, they weren't created as God. They were created like Him in His image. They bore his likeness. But what, how did they try to attain their likeness to God? They reached out to take it for themselves. Desire gone wrong. Good desire. Taking that desire by our own means and our own way. 
And, and here's the challenge, man. This desire that we have, it's, it's intense. It is deep. David's in a wilderness. He has a deep longing and desire. And these desires that I'm talking about in our lives, they're deep. They're intense. Think about it. Abraham has a desire for safety for his family. That's not a bad thing. But the way he seeks it for himself is he takes his wife and gives, him, gives her over to the Pharaoh. It's, it's not bad to want to protect your family, giving your wife to the king. Mm, not the best means of by going about that. Desire gone wrong. Jacob has a desire to be blessed of God. It's a great desire. We should seek the blessing of God. But he takes it by pretending to be someone he's not. Moses, he desires to protect his people, those who are most vulnerable. That's what he does early on in his life as he takes an Egyptian life in protection of his people. Desire gone wrong. And the list goes on and on and on and on. We could go through many biblical stories and we could all stand up here and, and tell our own stories of where our desires have gone wrong, where we reached out and took it for ourselves. Good desire, but we went by our means rather than God's means. Here, here's maybe the way I want to say it. Desire taken leads to destruction and pain. Desire given to God results in receiving. Desire taking leads to destruction and pain. However, desire given to God results in receiving. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Take delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. He'll give you your heart's desires. You will receive what you truly are longing for. See, we, we in our heads, we have these desires and then we, we think, oh, if I can do this, this, that, or whatever, if I can reach out and take it, this is what I'll get. But often when we do that, almost every time what we're left with is not what we actually thought we were going to get. Instead, if we take those desires that are in us and we hand them and we give them before God, we lay them at God's feet and say, God, this is what I'm, this is what I'm seeking after. This is what I long for. This is the deep longing of my heart. Now, how does it come about in my life in your way and in your time? It looks like Joseph, right? He desires to reign and he's even given this desire from God. Early on, he has these dreams. And Joseph's life is a life that he gives it to the Lord and it was given to him eventually. But it took a long time and it didn't necessarily look like he ever thought it was going to look. What about David? Does that, David, here we are like in this psalm. This is a great picture. David desires to be the king. And for years, years he's anointed, but he's not the king. Had opportunity after opportunity to take it by his own hands and go ahead and slay Saul and become king. And he says, I will not touch the one that God has appointed. So David has this desire to be king. That desire was given to him by God, by Samuel, was anointed. But he gave it to the Lord and allowed, allowed the Lord to bring about the desire of his heart in God's time. Solomon desired to be wise. And make no mistake about it, there were many ways that Solomon could have gone, gone about wisdom and seeking after wisdom, just as we have many ways that we can do it today. But Solomon gives it to the Lord. Lord, I want wisdom, and I know it only comes from you. So here, I'm just going to trust you with that. And God gave it to him. God gave him wisdom like the world had never seen. Strangely enough, in Solomon's life, you also see a man who, who does the opposite with his desires, who seeks peace with other nations, and he does that through the very way God said not to do it by marrying a bunch of other women. And so he's going to take peace for himself by marrying all these women of all these other nations. And it leads to brokenness, not only in his own family, but the entirety of Israel. Desire taken leads to destruction and pain. Desire given to God results in receiving. If you try to take your desires, you'll be taken. 
If you give your desire to the Lord, you'll receive the desire in His time. Here's the challenge, though. As David shows us, we actively seek what we desire the most. So we have to frame it and put it in our heads what we desire more than anything. And David says when he's in the wilderness and he has a potential of seeking all of these other things, all good things, some of it's just food and water, as he says. So I'm in a land that's dry, desolate, and without water. He says, but where I go is I gaze on you in the sanctuary. David's in the wilderness. Where's the sanctuary? Here's the question I would like to ask you. Where is the place you go to give your desire to the Lord? All of us, if we're a follower of Jesus, we should have in our schedule, in our environment, the place, the time, even the bodily, the bodily posture, and some sort of, I would say, procedure or strategy in your prayer time. And I'm not saying legalism. What I'm saying is discipline. These are two different things. God is, God is against legalism earning your way, but He's not against discipline. And shaping the way you live so that you experience and go to the sanctuary and you see the strength and the glory of God. You go to a place, there's a, a personal place and a time and a posture of your physical body and your heart and a way about the way you go about it. The procedure could be, you could journal, you could follow along with other people's prayers, you could read. There's a, if you don't have a procedure, I can, I can, we can talk about ones that may fit for you. Some of us who are more um, artistic inclined, it may be worship music and playing worship music. Some of us, it may need, we need to shut all things out and we need to be in silence. Because we have, if you're like me, that mind that just, if I hear a sound, I'm like, ooh, what was that? And here goes my brain. So I need silence. My question is, is Jesus your greatest desire? Is he our chief desire? And, and if so, are we looking at our lives and seeing that we are, we are going to these places, what we would call the sanctuary? place where we experience God personally, where we seek after him personally, and we lay our desires before him. David continues in verse 3 through 5, and he talks about that Jesus is our greatest delight or our greatest satisfaction. He says, my lips will glorify because your faithful love is better than life. Better than life. Your, your faithful love is better than life. Sometimes we just read over things and gloss over them. Better than, better than anything I experience. Like, this is the thing. It's the greatest delight of my life. And so I will bless you as long as I live. At your name I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. This is a man who's in the wilderness who doesn't have rich food at his, at his access. And yet he says and uses, he is hungering physically and yet he is saying, I may hunger physically, but I am satisfied with rich food in my relationship with you, Lord. This is direct contrast with how the people of Israel were in the wilderness. Where they didn't have access to water and food. And they just continually grumbled. Moses where's the food? Moses where's the water? And God called those people stiff necked. David however. Finds his greatest delight. In the Lord. He goes on, he says, I, I think of you as I lie on my bed and I meditate on you during the night watches. Here's what I know. We think deeply about what we delight in. We think about it. So then, like, what, of our, what are our minds filled with? 
And for me, oftentimes, it's everything under the sun. It's politics, it's school, it's jobs, it's business, it's retirement, it's health, it's relationships. And what, once again, not one of those things necessarily is bad, except probably politics. I don't really know of any good politics anymore. But, but they're all bad. I mean, they're all good. They're, not, not, like they're, they're things we should actually think about too, right? But how do we think about them? How we think about these things reveal what we delight in and are satisfied by. Because if we think, if we're thinking towards this example, school was one of the things. If we're consumed by school and making the perfect grade so that we can get this education, which all good things, so we can get this education so we can go get a job. Well, are you stressing out about it because this job is where you're finding your identity and your purpose in life? Is that thing going to be good? Yes. Should you chase after that? Yes. But if it's everything to you, it's not your greatest delight. It, it is your greatest delight, and the Lord is not. And we're seeking, we're seeking to fulfill the desire that can only be, be filled by the Lord through this education or this job or this career or this relationship or so on and so forth. Meanwhile, that is a well that is dry, all of those things. And we will remain thirsty and will continue seeking and seeking and seeking, thirsting and thirsting and thirsting. And this is why people move from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Never satisfied. Never delight. They never have a life of delight. See, oftentimes, self-centered delight is the thing that's driving us. Our desire is for, to be satisfied in a self-centered manner through all of these things, even if they're good things. But there is a deeper satisfaction, and it's rooted in the Lord. Here's the other thing. We talk about what we delight in. He continues, he says, I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I I'll rejoice. I'll, I will express outwardly, verbally. I've said this before. Joy isn't complete until you've shared it. It's just inherently true. I don't have to, the example is, watch a funny video. First thing you do after you laugh is you share it with someone so you can laugh together with them. We, we talk about what we delight in, whether that's football, whatever. It doesn't matter. We talk about it. If Jesus is our greatest delight, are we talking about him? Are we talking about him in our lives? Are we sharing him with others? I mean, verbally, are we talking about him? But also our body will worship, not just our mind, not just our mouths. It says, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. What is your... Like, think about it. This is action. Physical action is aimed toward what we delight in. We, we know this. Like, what if I just told my, li my wife all the time that I loved her, but I never did anything that showed her I loved her? Right? So it's not just verbal affirmation. It's not just sharing Jesus. It's actually, it's actually molding and shaping your body. I mean the way you live in this physical existence. Shaping the way you live with your hands and your feet and your mind and your body. Shaping it in the way that Jesus would call us to live. That, that picture and doing that, disciplining your life in that manner, communicates that Jesus is our greatest delight. Our actions should reflect our words, or they're just words and they're not genuine. David is in the wilderness. He was stripped of all his eternal comforts and his priorities reset. How many of us need our priorities reset? Our desires reset. Our delights reset. So that we search well. We search after what, our act, what will actually satisfy. And the only thing that is, according to David and according to the Bible, 
You are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. It's Jesus. In verse 6 through 11, David continues and, and he says, he says, when I, when I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. Like, I follow close to you. You're close. Your right hand holds on to me. But those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast, for the mouths of liars will be shut. Jesus is our strong defense. He is our strong defense. Notice what he says. Like, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. This is nearness to God provides protection. And here's what's amazing about this and what, what David acknowledges in the previous verses He's even, he's even correcting and self-correcting his own desires by saying, God, my desire and my, my desire is for you. That's what I'm seeking after. And he's, it's a reminder of this personal search that he's seeking after the Lord because he knows this. He needs to be near to the Lord because he needs protection from his own desires because they're deceptive. As we've been talking about all throughout this, our own desires uh, deceptively destroy us. It's deception. The Bible says our heart is deceitful above all things. There's a deceptive nature to our desires as we looked at. This is why Adam and Eve, Abraham, Jacob, and Moses, as I explained to us, these desires gone wrong. The desire wasn't necessarily bad, but the way they played it out in their life by reaching out and taking for themselves, it was deceptive. Furthermore, our true enemy... He wants to use our desires against us. In the garden. This is a picture of the serpent. He knows you'll be like God if you eat that fruit. Using a desire against them. It's deception. We've talked about this before too. Our, our great enemy, the adversary, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to, however you want to term it, there's multiple ways he's talked about in the Bible. His tactic is deception. He is a liar. His language, his native tongue is, is lies. And he deals destruction in our lives through lies. So we need the nearness of God for protection from that destruction. Meaning we need the nearness of God. We need to walk closely with the Lord so that our, our own desires, we don't, we don't manipulate and reach out and take for ourselves because we have that bent. But also our adversary is actively trying to use our de desires against us. And even, even Jesus, when he's in the wilderness tempted by, by the adversary, he uses scripture and fasting, which draws him closer to the Lord and the Spirit of God. He, and, and we've said this before. Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, wasn't at his weakest. He was at his strongest. When we're, when we're being stripped of all the comforts of this life, and it's just it's us, and we are near to God more than anything, that's when we're at our strongest. Even if it doesn't feel like that. Where we are weak, he is strong. The nearness of God provides protection. Often, no, I don't want to say often. I hear people say sometimes, God, where were you? Where were you? They're in the wilderness. They're in a time of hurting. And they're like, God, where are you? Where were you in this moment in my life? And sometimes we've been led into that by the Spirit of God, just like just like Jesus was, to a moment of great to, of the dark night of the soul, as it, as I've discussed. But sometimes it's said by those who are nowhere near the Lord relationally. They don't have any relationship with the Lord, and they're like, "Where are you?" And, and I think Jesus is looking back. He's like, I, "I'm right here. You you just won't be with me." 
You want me to be your protection, but you don't want to be with me. And some of us probably have been there in life, right? Where we've experienced the ramifications of our sin and the hurt and the pain that we've caused. And then we have this temptation to look at God and be like, God, where were you? And he's like, I was with you, but you weren't walking with me. And the beautiful thing is that we talk about here, God will forgive us. Yes. He will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He, will rem he chooses to remember them no more. He will forgive us. But that doesn't mean that we always get out of the consequences on this earth of our sin. And that's hard to handle sometimes. And this is exactly what's being pointed at. And he says they will be given over to the power of the sword. And this is something we've mentioned before too. Enemies will reap what they sow. God is a God who judges. And there's coming a day when God is going to judge. And there's times where the day of the Lord, as the Bible calls it, where he brings judgment on a nation or a people or a person, that happens. But most often, the way we see God's judgment play out is people getting what they actually want. You want to draw swords? You're going to die by a sword. That's a natural law that God has put into place. And it's a judgment on that way of living. It's not good. You want to seek out and take for yourself? It'll be taken from you. That's the story of Jacob, a deceiver who goes out and gets everything on his own, and then he gets what? Taken by Laban. You want to live that way and live your life according to these things. You have these desires for things. They're good things, but you want to go get them on your own? You want to take them for yourselves? They'll be taken from you too. It's brutal. You want to take your desires your way? Okay. But it won't be what you thought it would be. How often has that been true in our lives? judgment of God reigns. It will reign when Jesus comes back and judges it all, and it even reigns today. The mouths of liars will be shut. And here's the challenge, man. This is like, this is like all of us. We are the liars. So it's easy to look out there and say the enemy's out there, but one of the things I talked about is the nearness of God provides protection from our own deceptive desires in our heart, our own heart. The lying that goes on in here. There's these book of collection of poems written. I've been reading some of them on Wednesday nights, and I want to read you one. They're called Gorillas of Grace. But this one's titled, Drive Me Deep to Face Myself. Here's what he says. Lord, grant me your peace, for I have made peace with what does not give peace, and I am afraid. Drive me deep now to face myself so I may see that what I truly need to fear is my capacity to deceive and willingness to be deceived. My loving of things and using of people my struggle for power and shrinking of soul. My addiction to comfort and my sedation of conscience. My readiness to criticize and my reluctance to create. My clamor for privilege and my silence and injustice. My seeking for security and my forsaking the kingdom. Lord, grant me your peace. Instill in me such fear of you as will begin to make me wise and such quiet courage as will enable me to begin to make hope visible. Forgiving, delightful. Loving, contagious. Faith, liberating. Peacemaking, joyful. And myself, open and present to other people and your kingdom. This is a man who knows the deceptive nature of his own desires. 
and his capacity to reach out and take even good desires on his own means. And this is going to be a really strong statement. But I really want us to lean into it. When our desires are not given to the Lord, we are functioning as his enemy. When our desires are not given to the Lord, we're functioning as his enemy. When we're not allowing him to bring about our desires of the desires of our heart, when we're not allowing him to bring them about in our lives, we're bringing them about in our lives, which sets us up in opposition to him. I know that's strong. But I believe the psalmist David is showing us that in Psalm 63. In my own personal struggle, I'll just tell you, this is hard because I want what I want. And I want it sooner than later. I don't know about you. Most often the challenge for me is not shaping my desire around what God would want for me. It's about having what God would want for me now rather than when God wants it. It's a time issue rather than a, a desire issue. And even more scary, I can use scripture and logic to justify my means of taking what I desire. I don't know if you're as messed up as me, but I'm pretty good justifying my own desires and my own reaching out and taking of the fruit or putting on of the skin so I look like my brother. So what do we do? Because I think we're all like, mm, that's I see myself here. We go to Psalm 63 and do, do what David did in the wilderness. We give our desires to the Lord. God, here's what I desire. I'm a hungry, I'm thirsty. I'm the king. I should be not in the wilderness. I should be where the king is and should be commanding his armies and living in the palace. Whatever else kings do. Spreading peace among the nations. But that's not where he finds himself. So he says, God... You are my God. I'm not going to seek those things. I'm going to seek you and trust that you will bring these things into my life when it's right and when it's done. And that's enough. Jesus is our chief desire. Jesus is our greatest delight. Jesus is our strong defense. So here's three things. Josh, you can come. I told Elizabeth I was going to be 25 to 35 minutes today. I think I'm close. Three things. Some of us, this may be new to us, and this whole idea of Jesus being the thing that we're longing for, our greatest delight, and giving our desires to Jesus. And if that's you, if this is new to you, if you're online or you're in this room, like just admit your opposition to the Lord. Just admit it. That's what the, the Bible says. Just confess before the Lord. Like, this is who I am. Self-awareness, being honest before the Lord. Like, this is who I am. And when we confess with our mouth that we are sinners and that Jesus is the Christ, He is the Messiah, He's the ultimate authority. We, we receive the gift of salvation. We are rescued from the wilderness, the great spiritual wilderness, the thing that the wilderness that we all are in. Doesn't mean, let's like David, that we're going to, the situation in our life, we're going to be brought out of it at the snap of our fingers. But God will, He will begin to shape and mold our desires and bring about what He wants for our lives when we give our lives to Him. If you're a believer, just like baseline, how do I, 
how do I give my, my desires over to Jesus? It's, it's nothing novel. There's an ancient practice of prayer that Jesus practiced and that the church has been doing for over 2,000 years. And it's stood the test of time because it works. So I'll go back to this thing I mentioned a minute ago. Where's your place, time, posture, and procedure around getting alone with the Lord? Are you intentional about that? Believers of Jesus and Jesus himself was intentional around this ancient practice of prayer. And then third, maybe you're in the room and you're like, I'm there. I've been disciplined in my prayer life. Following Jesus. But I see how I need to continue giving my desires to the Lord so that He can direct them and bring about and, and bring them about in my life the way that He would want them to. Or call this reach. If you want to reach a little bit further in your faith, the ancient practice of confession. Share your desires with trusted friends honestly and openly. Hey, here's what, here's what, I, here's what I desire. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm trying to accomplish in life. And here's the selfish pieces of it that I can see. And here's where I can see that I, I feel like God is leading me in that direction. He wants to make himself known through me doing this thing. But there's also, hey, listen, we're complex in, individuals, aren't we? One one author wrote a song called In Every Vice There Is In Every Virtue There's Vice. In every good deed we do, there's these self-centered, there's this little bit of self-centered, we see how it will benefit us, you know. And when we confess to our brothers and sisters, like, hey, like I feel that every week I get up here, and there's like, there's this, there's this feeling, desire towards presenting myself and doing it for self-centered reasons. Go to the Lord. Like, God, be honest. And I try to talk about them with my wife and just get them out of me. Get it away. Because I don't, I don't truly want it, but also I do, I do want it too. And it's tough. And I've got to continue to go before the Lord and practice confession. And it really helps among our brothers and sisters when we do it. But it's, it's not easy to be open and honest with others. It's not easy. David was willing to share this with everyone just open it up and here it is we see David's desires all throughout the Psalms and we're going to see them more in the coming weeks so if you want to reach practice of confession discuss it and pray with friends family here's the deal when we seek God we receive satisfaction Just like when Elizabeth, somebody brings her like really good gluten-free food. She's like, oh, it's satisfying. How many things do we chase after and people do we chase after? And it's not satisfying. It's not actually what God would have. Let's come back to Psalm 63 and remember that David tells us to seek after. Let's pray together. Dan's going to lead us in a short song.